Hello, dear friends. We are sincerely pleased to greet you again, and today we are going to talk to the esteemed Igor Mikhailovich Danilov. Greetings. Igor Mikhailovich, our previous conversation has left us all in feelings of deep love and silent gratitude. And today I would like to begin our meeting with expressing this gratitude in words. Therefore, thank you very much for this incredible gift, for the fact that all of us could feel this power of love, God's grace, and for the fact that He led us all to the depth. And, you know, a lot of people, many for the first time, while some felt this source of life in them so deeply inside, and people passed their immense gratitude to you for the fact that all of us together received an experience of being collectively immersed in the feeling of love, an experience of unity and the feeling of home. All of us understand perfectly well that in order to evolve in this love, we should intensify this love during the day in every moment. But besides that, we should also work on ourselves, study our consciousness and understand where it actually robs us. And you know, all of us collectively gained an experience of how easy it is to dive into the depth altogether. Yet since ancient times, a great deal of attention has been given to the fact that people also worked together collectively on themselves and grew spiritually. So there is the following question — why? Why is it easier to overcome those barriers of the system together? The question is ambiguous, so to say. Let's talk about it, friends. I understand what our conversation today will be about, friends. But this is really ambiguous. It's really easier to do it in a group, but you can also do it yourself. Again, some people achieve spiritual salvation on their own and rather quickly. However, in the entire history there have been very few of them. While, let's say, for the majority of people to achieve it, especially those for whom it is hard to experience spiritual contact, they surely need a group. It's easier with a group. Well, let's sort everything out, shall we? Yes, let's do it. So, it's an ambiguous question. We touch upon a lot of different aspects here, right? Why a group? What is a person in a group? What is a group itself? And many other questions. What should be and what shouldn't be there? What hinders? Yet, the first thing in a group is hindrances. I mean, why has a group gathered? Well, what do we start with? Probably with a question of why it's so hard for people to talk about their spiritual experience. And why… In a group, you mean? Yes, in a group. And why is it so hard to sort of share one's victories? Friends, it's really true. In the time of the first Christians, there was a practice that actually came from Jesus Christ and His first disciples. It was catharsis. I mean, it's a very fast path, and it is really straight. Well, basically, it is that very alatra only in those days, so to say. So what was the meaning of that catharsis? A group of like-minded people gathered together, all of whom were attuned towards attaining God's love. Everyone confronted their consciousness, meaning that which is called Satan in religions, right? And everyone gained their own experience, so they shared that experience. And what does purification or catharsis mean? It is precisely the moment when these secrets are instilled in us. In fact, we are sort of afraid to say what comes into our head. We are. In order to maintain some contrived image that we form of ourselves for people, so that people… To seem. Yes, to seem, but not to be. And all of us strive to seem. Everyone draws his or her own image. Someone is sort of very cool, like you shouldn't even approach him, he's like a wolf. Well, inside he is simply a jackal. Others pretend to be so cultured and educated, while inside, inside there are scoundrels. That's how it always takes place, you see. In order for the internal to correspond to the external, 
A human should actually become free, become free from the system, from consciousness, from all those images, from all this imposing and thinking. But what do people encounter? It's a group practice. If you stand in front of a mirror and tell all these problems to a mirror, so to say to yourself, I said it figuratively, to a mirror, although you can do it in front of a mirror too, it doesn't matter. When you tell yourself about your problems, it's already a victory. Whereas when you voice it in a group, not only do you overcome yourself, but you also warn others, you see. In other words, this is experience, this is practice. And for many people it is really hard to open their mouth. Why? Because that's where the devil holds their tongues, you see. I mean, he doesn't let them speak. What does he start reasoning with? How come do you want to tell someone what is inside of you? Your thoughts… And here, my friends, there is a catch. The catch is that these thoughts are not yours. It is actually the devil who imposed these thoughts on you. He made you, let's say, ugly and bad inside, not corresponding to the external image that he himself creates out of you for other demons in other people's minds. And later on, it is he who actually operates with that. Precisely by that, he stops you from speaking and says, how come you are so good, you are perceived like that? How will they perceive you after you tell them what you think about? But do you really think? No, my friend. You only finance with your life those images and thoughts which Satan has imposed on you. This is what the true followers of Christ, the true disciples, talked about. They shared that without embarrassment, after all, you are exposing Satan, not yourself. You as Personality are maturing at this time. What bad things can be said about someone who hasn't done anything? None. An immature Personality cannot do anything, while Personality in general cannot do anything bad. It's just that it is presented with situations from an angle where it is forced to find various problems, and it doesn't matter whether they are real problems in life or just fantasies from the system. But Personality doesn't discern, it doesn't see and doesn't perceive three-dimensionality, so it finances everything blindly. And here, when a human begins to develop, he takes responsibility already as Personality, you see? And he as Personality strives for the spiritual world, he strives to really attain, to comprehend this love, to generate it and to direct it towards the spiritual world. And the main obstacle stands in the way. The main obstacle is the devil or our consciousness, let's put it so, if it is convenient. It doesn't matter. Whatever we call it, it won't make us feel any better, friends. So we again return to what we said a thousand times. When a person doesn't have the experience of being an observer, when a person doesn't have the experience of perceiving himself as Personality, he cannot separate himself from consciousness. Consciousness is him. In other words, he perceives himself as consciousness. But this is actually manipulation. A person defends it. Of course. And then a person entirely defends himself, not consciousness. He perceives himself as consciousness, and it seems to him that it is he who generates and creates these thoughts, and consciousness also accuses him of that. Therefore, it is certainly difficult for a person to open his mouth and tell the truth simply because he is still stupid. He hasn't fledged yet, he's a silly child. He doesn't understand that it is not him, it is Satan. It is Satan who instills a thought into him. And it is actually Satan who holds him by the tongue. So the whole point during catharsis is for a person to begin to expose Satan. They say exposure, exposure. Many have heard that in religions. Well, in fact, what kind of exposure do they have there? None. Meanwhile, the exposure of Satan is exactly when you openly tell everyone those secret thoughts which he instilled in you, as well as those plans which he had for your life, then those plans cannot come true because you expose all the secrecy. And you yourself will not want that either, but at the same time other people see that and they are already warned against various mistakes. You see, what else is valuable about a group class? Precisely the moments of catharsis, is when a person tells how he, while being already in love and in joy, suddenly perceives himself full of problems, with a lot of, say, images in his mind, in disputes, almost in fights with someone in his thoughts. So here he can simply wake up to the horror of what he is doing. He doesn't understand how he ended up there. Well, some people start analyzing when and what came and when it left, it doesn't matter, my friends. You are already trapped. So it's important to immediately do what? To plunge into Lothos. 
into spiritual practice. To restore this inner state. Of course, to restore the inner contact, to return to love. So it doesn't matter. As soon as you have recalled it, you should immediately return. And it's even better not to lose love. As soon as you feel that the feeling of love is subsiding in you, no matter how the system distracts you towards external things, no matter what's going on, let even the whole world collapse. Even vice versa, if the whole world is collapsing, it's necessary to accumulate this love even more and send it to the spiritual world in order to restore this bridge, right? So all those secrets, all the techniques that Satan uses against us, when a person shares them, he forearms other people, he warns them against his own mistakes. Just imagine a group of, let's say, 500 people or 10 people, it doesn't matter how many, even two people, they are already forearmed, because they already know other tricks which Satan hasn't used on them yet, but in case something is only approaching, a person knows perfectly well what Satan's next move or action will be towards him. Well, of course, it is simpler, easier and faster to advance like this. Plus, when spiritual practices are performed jointly, for example, we take the true lotus, then naturally those who are leading the way will pull up those who lag behind. So it is certainly simpler and easier because a group, when it is synchronized, is a unit. You see, I mean it is, well, let's put it in the oriental terms, a single aggregate is formed, or a single field, a single mood, a single group. Of course, it matures entirely and completely. And sometimes the same spam comes to such united organisms, so to say, to such aggregates. Yes, that's also very valuable. When a group has a class, and people are really open, they are indeed in catharsis, they study the system, and then a thought comes to a person. Doesn't matter. They are involved in a spiritual discussion, and a red car comes to a person's mind. He says, you know, the system is imposing a red car on me now. And the funny thing is that a lot of people will pick that up. They will say, yes, I've had a picture too. Most of them will have a red car, but some may have it of a different color. Yet, a picture of a car will definitely be foisted. Or secondary consciousness comes into play if the system starts attacking, let's say, a group. Why? This also happens when a group gets a little bit distracted, a little bit weakened. They delve into some details, you know, they switch to pettiness. Again, Satan interferes, begins to divert them a little bit, and immediately starts throwing in thoughts. For example, I'll repeat again, friends. Some people get a thought about a car, others get a tire fitting shop, still others get batteries, but everything is somewhere close thematically. It just that our demons also perceive orders of their master in different ways. I also remember you once gave an associative example that this is like you have, let's say, a group in Viber or Telegram, and some information is simply thrown in there, that very thought. There are people who connect and listen to this information. They invest their attention there, while there are people who would ignore it. Who do not invest, right. Igor Mihalovich, is it possible to mature in groups only by listening? Let's put it simply, okay? Let's take the experience of Jesus Christ and His disciples. There was actually a dialogue there. Communication. There were studies, right? Yes, they communicated. They taught, really taught, how to come to the spiritual world. Let's take the life of the Prophet, the last Prophet. After all, there was communication there. Right? Yes. There was a dialogue. People studied and aspired. And let's take the time of Peter's coming to power, when Simeon became Peter. What started? Formation of a religion. They formed a religion, and a monologue began. People lost the right to ask questions. And what do we have? Just look at how everything has changed. Listeners. Of course. Who follow instructions. If there used to be friends, there used to be a united group, and they went to God together. Later on, people became listeners of what they were told. And you know, again, I don't want to offend anyone, I'm just calling things by their proper names, as facts. Tell me, what is a spiritual path? A spiritual path is a road that we pave by means of love for the spiritual world, right? This is mentioned everywhere. There is nothing else. What should we do? 
We should intensify love in ourselves. Yes, we should behave appropriately. What for? I'll explain, in order not to lose the inner connection even for a moment, right? We shouldn't give rise to the antagonists of love in ourselves. Again, that very anger, hatred or envy, you know, it will devour a lot of our energy, right? Those are such voracious creatures, those are worms in our heads, which start living instead of us. So we should get rid of them. Just like of any obsessive images that we usually form in our everyday life, because any image, when we bring it to life in our thoughts, when we talk to it, just like I'm talking to you right now, and many of our friends have daily conversations with a great number of images in their heads, what does it give rise to? It gives rise to us creating an illusion. We do not talk in real life. We talk in a fantasy. But it's not a fantasy, because the image does exist. It is phantom, but it is material. Hence it exists owing to something. Well, some people will say, owing to our imagination and thought. Yes, our imagination and thought, but it lives at the expense of our life. Do you see the point? And these subtleties should be studied. We should eliminate all these fantasies, we don't need them in our heads. Why create additional sources of expenses for yourself, which cannot be repaid, which only take away your means for life, but do not give you anything? I mean, efficiency is very low, isn't it? It is. Right. Therefore, friends, I just give you a fact. I don't offend anyone, but just answer me. A simple example that we observe in religions nowadays, we take a textbook, okay? It is literally a textbook that describes… Some Holy Scripture. Yes, it doesn't matter. Holy Scripture. A priest is standing on the stage, and a lot of people are beyond the stage. He is reading to them what is written in the textbook, while everyone is holding a textbook in their hands or just repeating after him. Can you read it at home or what? A simple question. What will reading give us? Well, whatever, let's take the works by Turgenev or Alatra, by Anastasia Novik, and we will read it together. And then what? A literature club. Right, and then we are told, do not kill, do not steal. All right, we won't steal, we won't kill. That's it, we'll do as we are told. So in this literature club, we hope to gain life. At the same time, we must necessarily fear God and respect the priest as God's intermediary or buffer between us and God. Well, that's true. You know, yes, I'm aware that many people might take offense, but friends, you have to understand that when it comes to your life, true life, as they say, the after-death destiny, right? But it's not an after-death destiny. It is merely when our body disintegrates when we leave it and actually gain life. Is that death? Death is when, you know, complete annihilation of a subpersonality takes place. That's what death is. Well, in this case, it is the gaining of life, let's say. Right? So, if our goal is to gain true life, eternal life, there is no room for sentimentality. Sorry, friends. It's true. And you yourselves understand everything very well when we do not invest effort, time and diligence. When we do not gain life, we will not gain it by listening to someone else's conversations, by shifting responsibility onto someone else. It is certainly convenient, isn't it? I understand, it's very convenient. This information is really shocking, that on this vice of ours, on this desire to shift responsibility, there has been built… Yes, it's a vice. And why has it happened this way? In fact, all religions have stumbled on that. Right. On human laziness. You see, what does a person need? A person needs to shift responsibility onto someone else, doesn't he? That's firstly, so that someone would be responsible for them. Secondly, yes, they always look for an opportunity to avoid that responsibility. Of course, sure. Secondly, what does a person need? At the very least, a set of rules that are easy for me to follow and understandable in everyday life, meaning I must get up with the left foot. So I'll train my body to get up with the left foot. And this is a holy deed, you see? Some kind of guidelines, as it seems to a person. Absolutely right. That is, literally, in everyday life. Let's say, I must not swear. Okay, I won't swear. That's it, and a place in heaven is already guaranteed for me. I must go to a priest once a week, bring him some tribute. 
and all matters are resolved. Isn't that convenient? Tell me. Thus, on this laziness and the desire for magic, why? Because eventually all the priests degrade, well, I mean religions. Again, what are religions? Religions are nothing, it's a general name. In fact, it's an enterprise of priests, let's speak honestly, right? I mean, it's their job, they come to work, and many of them treat it like a job. It is what feeds them and where they make their living. So the attitude towards it is exactly the same, you see? But at the same time, it is precisely built in a way appealing for people, you see? People shift responsibility onto that very priest, they comply with a certain minimal set of rules, they may even read prayers or practice meditations, it doesn't matter. There are a lot of religions, they're different and they have different approaches to that, but there are certain rules, I must repeat some mantra twice a day, light some candles somewhere or do something else, right? I must light those incense devices, and that's it, I get points. My friends, if it were that easy to come to God, you know, we would now live here like in heaven, isn't that so? It is. Meanwhile, in what kind of world do we live? And why do we live now in the times that all the Prophets spoke about, including the last Prophet, peace be upon him? They called things by their proper names. Yes, we are lucky, we are the chosen among the chosen. We live in the end times, and our choice determines whether humanity will continue to exist or not. This is really true as well. So, what should we do in the end times? Just tell me. Should we live like our ancestors did for millennia, or start living the way our ancestors did more than 6,000 years ago, when they were faithful to God? and had no priests. Yes, in groups there were people in charge. But who is a person in charge? They are people just like you and me, aren't they? It's just that they were ahead. They could share their experience. When spiritual liberation was treated, you know, not as some kind of work or some kind of, I don't know, a club or a hobby, but as the most important thing in this life, when it was a goal, I say it again, a goal, not a show. For the neighbors to think that I'm a believer, that I'm good, I will go to a temple, say, once a week, right? Mm -hmm. As for what is going on in my head, who will deal with that? Who will clean that up? Who will bring us to life? Tell me, please. A priest, he should overcome his own Satan first. It is also a big temptation for those who are in charge in such groups. Yes. When people want to shift responsibility onto you and only want to listen but not participate in the dialogue. Well, you know, that's also a problem. When there is no dialogue in a group, when it goes sort of according to religious canons, again, someone comes forward, he's reading and talking, while the rest are sitting and listening, then what have you gathered for, friends? Have you gathered to listen? There are plenty of different temples, it's beautiful there. This practice has been perfected there for thousands of years, just understand correctly, the theatre is at the highest level there, while you are sitting and listening to some fellow, the same as you are, who are reading you fairy tales, you see? Because it all turns into fairy tales. If you don't have experience of working on yourself, there's nothing to ask, you see? If there is no dialogue in a group, but there is a monologue, it means that the group has either just gathered, or it goes in the wrong direction. I'll put it simply. Why? Because this is work, and everything is important here. If people cling to life, if they really cultivate in themselves love for the spiritual world and already feel it at least a little bit, they understand how important this is, and they strive to protect it, because shaitan, you know, like a monkey, always wants to steal it. You have to keep an eye on him. As for those practices, there are no trifles there. Everything has to be studied, you have to practice and work every second. At the first stage, it's really difficult. And here, any advice, any experience of those who are already at least a little bit ahead is important, you see? And not to ask questions here. If you don't have questions, well, it's one of two things. Either you are a bodhisattva, or you don't need this. Isn't that so?
You pretend that you advance, meaning you are under Satan's control. That's the point. There is another question, Igor Mikhailovich. When you expose consciousness within yourself, when you see these stereotypes, yes. when you voice those secret actions of the system, apparently that very internal liberation, let's say, from this oppressive consciousness occurs. That's exactly the point. That's the point. Yes. The first step is again. Well, the very first step, my friends, is to understand that consciousness is not you. Once you understand this and catch it on a lot of facts, well, here again, you have to study, because there are a million techniques on how you can catch it and see for yourself that consciousness is not you, as it turns out. It's not you who formed these thoughts, it's not you who ordered them, but when you are guided by them, you are a slave. You know, just a bio-machine, there is no other way to call it. A source of life for fantasies, someone else's, but not yours. The second stage is to understand that you are personality. There are a lot of different techniques for that too. When you understand that you are personality, you understand that there is consciousness. And consciousness is what has been called the devil since the dawn of time. So what's the next step at this point? It is to make sure that consciousness doesn't hinder your connection with the spiritual world and getting closer to it, and the only way is love. Precisely through genuine inner feelings, it is that very power which allows a person to gain life. So when we send our love, the one that is given to us for life, we do not waste it on fantasies, we do not feed with it, either demons, you know, like pigeons in the square, or the devil, our consciousness, let's put it this way, to make it clearer. When you spend these powers on love and give them to the spiritual world, you receive a hundred times more. So when you begin to receive it, it's already the beginning of gaining life, it is the inception of an angel. This is what we are here for, for the sake of life. So, one of the steps is the taming of that very Satan, you see? In other words, first we understand that there is Satan, then we understand that there is Personality, then we understand that there is the spiritual world, there is God, and then we remove what hinders us. Everything is very, very simple. But for that, yes, it's easier in a group. Of course it is easier. Igor Mikhailovich, the result of catharsis is actually a feeling of spiritual freedom. Of course. But what goes wrong if Meetings do not give this feeling of spiritual freedom. On the contrary, sometimes people return home even more burdened than they were before, and so on. What does this indicate? It means they have lived this day in vain, they gathered together in vain, they did the wrong thing. And why does this happen again? They came and they themselves succumbed to Satan when everyone was working spiritually while he was twisting their arms, restraining them. But they also followed his lead and began to judge someone quietly, within themselves. Let's say, the demon began to instill the following thoughts into consciousness, you know everything, you are the best, you are already a bodhisattva, what are you doing here? And so on, thus there is judgment. Comparison and exaltation, meaning all the stereotypical tricks from Satan and a person, didn't notice how he was trapped. Later on he leaves the class when everyone is elated. Well, he is robbed, you know, it feels like. You go to a marketplace to buy something delicious, but come back with nothing, your money has been stolen, you see? Isn't that true? It is. But sometimes, again, people in a group have a wrong approach, to catharsis, to their spiritual growth and to classes in general. Why? Because we know, let's say, everyone who engages in spiritual growth in groups knows what Satan does. He definitely foists a distractor from himself, you know. What for? So that we shift our entire attention towards some individual. For instance, we discuss something about generation of love or some tricks of that very system, we have a concrete dialogue. And at this moment, someone stands up and says, all this is fine, guys, but we actually know it all. Instead, can you clarify to me how the world actually manifests itself in the fourth dimension, you see? I mean, well… Or in which dimension do shadows live? Right, or in which dimension do shadows live? Yes. That's also a good question. 
And since the person is asking this question, it means he is interested. While we are all cultured and polite, we are sitting and we should do what? We should love people, shouldn't we? We should respect people and take their opinion into consideration. If a person asks such a question, it means he needs it for some reason. So we are sitting there being so tolerant. And then again, someone is surely leading the group, isn't he? There is a group coordinator, so to say. Yes, sure. But since he's a group coordinator, he's almost like a priest in religion. He must be responsible for everything, right? We have shifted the responsibility. If anything happens, he will coordinate the course of the conversation. Yes, we are sitting dissatisfied and indignant. Demons are running around in our heads with a tambourine. Well, we have shifted the responsibility onto someone else. Meanwhile, that someone doesn't even notice this because he's on his own wave, treats the group irresponsibly or is slightly distracted with something or the subject has also resonated with him. And just look, friends, there is a group of, let's say, 20 people or 10,000 people, doesn't matter. A destructor appears and a couple of people immediately pick it up from him. Why? Because that's how the system works. If two people pick it up, then another irrelevant remark by the distractor is already picked up by five people, not two. You see? Thus, Satan's team is growing. Why? Because people are drawing the whirlpool of those events. Do you understand? The question seems to be sort of interesting, right? But at the same time, it is sort of embarrassing to reprove that person. Yet, friends, pardon me, may I just ask each of you, Straightforwardly, answer for yourselves. If you go to such group classes, groups of spiritual growth, no matter where, no matter in what sect, religion, or hobbies group, whatever, you go there to develop spiritually, and such destructors appear, I have a simple question. What do you go there for? Do you go there to waste your own time, to give your own life to the system, after all, at the time when you do not grow spiritually, when you do not gain experience and practice, you waste your life. What for, friends? You actually come there in order to gain life, but you waste it. Regardless of how good a person is and what an interesting question he asks, what are you doing at the moment? We have just said that in classes you engage in practice, let's say, of how to resist Satan, so go ahead and resist him in practice. Actually, a lot of people feel that something is going wrong. Everyone feels. Everyone feels, and supposedly… Everyone feels. Only where are your tongues? Who holds them? There is no determination to say, yes, this is… What does no determination mean? No determination is again a trick from Satan, mm-hmm. right? Yes. I'll put it simply. If such a person stood up, called a participant, for instance, Vasilisa, by her name and said, you're a complete fool and look like a suitcase with ears. How would that Vasilisa behave? Would she sit modestly and forgive him everything? No. Demons would have gone mad and launched such a tirade towards him that… Well, isn't it true? We don't want to get involved in this, right? We don't want to activate those demons in ourselves. Yes. We want to sit it out quietly. Comfortably. Isn't it true? So that it would be comfortable. A person asks the correct question, right? Right. But it's inappropriate and not for this place. This person has confused physics or magic class with spiritual studies. While everyone is sitting and being silent, I see, the first thing that should be done in a normal, good way is to ask him, what have you asked this question for? Why have you asked this question here and now? It's a very good lesson for everyone to see how the system works and how it wants to lead you astray, how it tries to hold your tongue, and so on. If that person cannot answer or insist by saying, I'm just interested, I'm not interested in what you do, I'm interested in hearing the answers to this, then let him leave the group and go to a physics or magic club and study what he is interested in. But he shouldn't be in the group, especially if such things occur systematically. Right. Yeah, there are a lot of such people. And notice… Time after time. Right. There are a lot of people who actually attend spiritual classes and start drawing attention to themselves all the time. This works when the group is silent. You see, when, excuse me, everyone is so tolerant, like in a madhouse, there's no other way to put it, right? Because it's really madness to waste your own life and your own time and to play suicide chess with the devil when you come to spiritual classes in order to gain something, in order to maintain 
Contact with God. Isn't that nonsense? It is complete nonsense. Do you understand? If you cannot make lemonade out of this lemon, then you should get rid of it. It's like a carrion on a table, you see? It will spoil the whole meal, it shouldn't be like that. We may also voice what thoughts the system is telling people who are in such a situation at this moment. It says, this is a group lesson that we haven't passed. We should love our neighbor. If we didn't manage last time, let's try once again. For the more you repeat, one more time and yet one more time… Yes, you convince yourself. But let's stop it. Where do thoughts come from? Right. If a person really has a spiritual experience of working with the pyramid practice or the Chetveric practice, he understands where thoughts come from. When thoughts come from personality, from the spiritual, they are produced from within. It's not a thought, but an understanding. But when such thoughts are imposed, they always come from the right and behind. The system persuades. Yes, and why? Because it persuades you. But who persuades you? Your own demon persuades you. For demons are one community. It's all a product of one entity, the devil. Let's put it this way, it's the Internet, okay? And each of us have different programs, but the essence is the same. And naturally, it all works in unison. One provokes, while other imps hold us, and we sit like a herd of sheep and watch him clipping us, right? We give our own wool, our own life, our own meat. So are we still supposed to be happy about that, friends? Well, it's not good, let's say, to kick a person out the door, Why is it not good? A simple question. Yet, is it good when this person is so weak that he contributes to the stabilization of the whole group? A simple question. And here, friend, it's extremely important to understand that we don't actually kick out such people, destructors in a group, who are conductors of the system itself. We give them an opportunity to mature spiritually, in different conditions. Moreover, not to take a sin upon themselves. Why? Because when they serve Satan, they destabilize us, for they commit a sin, a very serious one at that. They take away our lives, they rob us. Therefore, we, on the contrary, take care of them. We make sure that they don't sin. We save them, don't we? At the same time, we create conditions so that we could really mature spiritually and nobody would distract us so that no slave of Satan would stand in our way when we go to God. That's the point, friends. Right? Let me give you another example. For instance, we are all hungry. We get together to have a meal, okay? We sit down at the table and put treats on it. And our friend comes in takes all these treats and gives them to pigs, saying, you don't need it because you are spiritual. And he begins to give us a lecture, for example, about the dangers of pastry and how we should go on a diet, that fasting is very good for health. He does this once on the first day, the second time on the second day, the third time on the third day. Who hasn't encountered that? Tell me, do we have to starve to death? Listening to his lectures and watching pigs growing fat instead of us? Mm-hmm. Or should we, perhaps, send this fellow to pigs and grow a little fat ourselves? Excuse me, I'm putting it straightforwardly. Which way is better? Friends, when we learn to value our own lives, we will increase the efficiency of our studies. I'm putting it simply. We will increase our own chances of gaining life. Therefore, we should remove everything that hinders us on our spiritual path, if we can remove it. And there is no room for ceremonies, there is no room for sentimentality or anything else, because it's a question of your life and not of something else. You see, there is nothing more precious than life. We are here, every single one of us, in order to gain life eternal. If we haven't done that, we have been here for nothing. We can plant a lot of trees, give birth to a lot of kids, build, I don't know, entire blocks of houses. Would that make you feel better? No, it wouldn't. You see, subpersonality doesn't care afterwards what you planted, built and gave birth to, if you haven't gained life. And every one of us knows that. After all, everyone among people knows the truth, and everyone feels the real truth, but consciousness, you know, twists and manipulates all this so easily. And when we are really, you know, like a ball, 
on the waves in a storm. We are tossed back and forth, we cannot even figure out where we are, who we are and what we are. Well, friends of mine, stop being balls on the waves, become an ocean, then everything falls into place. Everything is being put in order, but it actually depends on us whom to be, to be a slave of Satan or a free and a live angel. Everything is in our hands, everything is simple and easy. Value the time, especially value the classes you come to. After all, it's the most valuable thing you can have during this day. It's communication with people, it's a search for love and life. What can be better? Whereas if someone hinders you, just remove him, without hesitation. A simple question, a person may be spiritually weak, or he gave in to Satan, right? He gave in to him today, Okay, but if tomorrow the situation is the same and he gives in to him again, okay, how long will you tolerate that? Maybe you should send him away, let him work on himself, stabilize and realize that he's actually not a monkey on Satan's leash, but a human. And when he understands that, then you will take him back. Many people also think that when such a situation happens, they abstract themselves from the situation, they sit and sort of hold a dome, isolate themselves what a little bit. What kind of a dome do they hold? You know, this actually makes me laugh, he holds a dome, he protects something. The situation is behind the glass, it sort of doesn't concern you, but is it really so? Yes, exactly, he is so abstracted from the world, abstracted from everything, and he doesn't want to lose his connection with God at this time. What God are you with at this time? If you don't confront Satan. If you have neglected your friends, isn't that so? And prana. Your fellow travelers. Hence, you first of all have neglected yourself. You give your own life, your own energy of life. And in this case, you pay not only with prana, but with alat too. Then what? Well, friends, grow up. Because at this time, a person is judging anyway. I mean, he cannot, and he comes back to that. One hundred percent. Moreover, moreover, he was judging there, he came out judging, and until the next class he remembers that, and he is still judging. Such are Satan's tricks, and these tricks have to be analyzed. And when you have analyzed them during classes and understood them, you have to act in such a way that they do not dominate you, so that these tricks of Satan do not take away your life. In fact, they are very simple. It is very easy to overcome them. Very easy indeed if you know how. And it's even easier not to fall for them, right? Also, Igor Mikhailovich, there is another thing. It happens that people follow the spiritual path and they feel that this inner love which is expanding and this inner surge, and at some point they decide to isolate themselves from the group and to remove all sorts of attachments in order to follow the spiritual path independently. Of course, yes. How can you comment on this? Consciousness tells such a person, look, they come and talk all the time about the same consciousness, about some tricks, meanwhile you feel God, don't you? They hinder you, you are almost a bodhisattva. Well, they are, you know… Maturing. Maturing, yes, to put it mildly. You shouldn't go along with them, they only hold you back. You should practice on your own. You don't need anyone, you can do it. Isolate yourself and mature. And what does a person do? He isolates himself and withers. No, he matures as Satan's professional feeder and nothing more. Those are tricks. Look at what is going on within you and how quickly you lose. What you have gained during the time in a group, that love, that has just begun to emerge in you. If it had emerged in you, you wouldn't have had such a foolish thought. Well, Satan would have tried to foist it, but you wouldn't have accepted it, because you would know whose tricks those are, isn't that so? You know, times are hard nowadays, and everyone knows that, everyone understands and feels that. Let's be honest and call things by their proper names, okay? Nowadays the devil is so powerful that it's extremely hard for a person to escape without help. After all, even knowing, understanding, having experience and help, we still keep falling, and many of us, up to ten times a day, have to pull ourselves out of the grip of the Satan, right? Yes. Right, while many people even climb out of his stomach because he sucks them in so badly. But what can you do? Such is life. Therefore, without help it would be extremely difficult. So let's imagine, you know, Let's say a beautiful meadow, okay? Or better yet, a flower garden. 
A pyramid-shaped flower bed. Have you imagined it? A flower bed that is standing in the middle of a dehydrated desert. The sun is scorching, the humidity is almost zero, but there's water dripping on it from above. Those flowers which are higher receive more water, those which are lower, which are still growing, yes, they receive a little less, it's a bit harder for them. But it's up to them to reach out for water, for moisture, isn't it? In other words, life is given to them, help from above descends to them, and feeling that, they reach out for it. Meanwhile, one flower says, or rather, not a flower, but, I don't know, some wormling in this flower says to it, look, you are down here, you are only trying to sprout, but look at how many flowers are here, water is dripping, and so forth. What does God see? God sees a flower bed, a flower bed covered with flowers, that's all. He doesn't see you, does He? But when you distance yourself, when you separate and distance yourself, you will become an individual, and God will admire only your beauty. What do you have to do among these sunflowers? Come on, you are a beautiful rose. Separate yourself. And what does a person do? He separates himself. Who says that? Will angels actually tell him that? No, angels do not come in touch with people in general until they grow up. Isn't that so? It is the devil whispering. Thus, by Satan's instigation, instead of fighting against him, a person listens to him, his pridefulness is affected. So he walks away from that flower bed. A simple question. Up there, the Divine moisture descends, which nourishes every flower. While there, there is scorching sun, desert and aridity. Thus the flower immediately turns into a dry thorn. Is God a camel? To admire and delight in a thorn? Of course He is not. Here's the answer for you, friends. Yet how many of such people do we see, of those who separated and distanced themselves, because the experience of hermits, of Holy Fathers inspired them? Some chase after magic, while some just went there due to foolishness. Well, in the end, the result is always the same. Do you know why the Holy Fathers actually retreated in the past? They didn't retreat from people, they retreated from religion. They retreated from that practice which is established among them. When a monk's life is timetabled, he must mutter the same thing, sing songs, dance on one foot, and so forth. And he must supposedly communicate with God, while in fact his main goal and task is fundraising. And again, fundraising, as well as strengthening the power of the organization itself. Who doesn't know that? That's why those people who really longed for God and understood through feelings that Satan also exists and didn't want to work for Satan, but wanted to serve God, they had to move away a little bit, under the pretext of seclusion, you know. In other words, they supposedly undertook hard labor for the glory of their organization, but in reality they were just going towards God. In this way they tried, to avoid the pressure of this burden. Yes, it's a weakness. It's a weakness, in fact. Because a person must become hardened like steel, you know, in fire, in water, and wherever he would be. If you strive for God, nothing will hold you back. Whatever obstacles Satan puts in your way, it's all his tricks. When you realize that he is Satan, and he tells you that it is hard, well, what is hard about it? Let's say I had a good friend, and now he is one, of the members of my family, let's put it this way, as well as of yours, friends. Unfortunately, he's not with us now, but fortunately, he's always with us. Let's put it this way, he was from the Christian Orthodox religion, precisely from the Christian Orthodox one. Moreover, he was active and serious. He defended it, he defended all the virtues of this religion. But as for all the stupidities, he called them by their proper names. Of course, his associates didn't like him, but people loved him very much. So nothing prevents a person from being honest and righteous even in religious organizations. Excuse me, defending what is spiritual before Satan himself is not difficult anywhere.
You know, Igor Mikhailovich, you have just mentioned those people who distanced themselves from, let's say, the canons of that very religion, from those very chaffs. Not from the canons, but from the rules. Yes, from the chaffs, from the from rules. From the written rules contrived by people. From this circus, theatricality and stupidity. They distanced themselves. They had to do that. Yes, but the most interesting thing is that now it is clear that when they met each other, yes. precisely like-minded people, interestingly, and it has always surprised me that But when they met, they asked each other one main question. How is your prayer? So there is the understanding that from this question, it actually becomes clear how your inner dialogue with God is going on and taking place. Whether you are closer to God yes. or you have some difficulties, but from such perhaps indirect evidence and such information, it is clear that they also didn't miss the opportunity to share their inner experience and to further mature on the spiritual path. Of course they didn't miss it. Experience is very valuable. The spiritual path is wonderful, but since Satan is standing on the path in front of us, in all his multiformity, yet what is Satan, friends? It's a legion. It's a real legion of all sorts of demons indeed. And each of them has its own approaches, let's say. You know, if we think about it, it is such a hardly surmountable borderline that you can actually surmount easily if you go with your eyes open along a smooth road. Do you understand? Or you can easily lose your way if your eyes are blindfolded, if you have no compass and walk across mountains and forests without knowing where you are going. So where will you arrive? Isn't that true? It is. Even if you are determined to arrive somewhere, it's not certain that you will get there, my friend. Therefore, You shouldn't complicate what is simple. Well, all the complications originate from Satan, first and foremost. You know, they catch you on bravado, as it is said among common people. Are you strong enough? Everyone can go to God this way. But are you strong enough to be in seclusion? That's another individual way. By oneself, yes, exactly. Right. Why do you take crutches again? It's a task for strong ones. Lean on somebody and listen to someone. Don't you yourself understand simple things? Or the experience of martyrdom. Oh, that one indeed, you know. The experience of martyrdom is a separate subject. It is such a stupidity that, God forbid, why and where did this experience of martyrdom come from, do you know? Because everyone, not just those who brought the knowledge here, but also those who picked it up, they always had problems. Really, you know, it is such a heavy burden. Well, as a rule, it was hard at the beginning, while later on everything became easier. So that's where martyrdom originated from. It was likening and simony. As they suffered, so I do, right? Let's not bring up this subject. It is ridiculous. Igor Mikhailovich, I also remember how you spoke about the importance of working on oneself and compared it to the fact that there is indeed a whole rock in front of us on the spiritual path. This is really so, and I would even put it simply. Let's try to visualize it again. We actually enjoy dreaming and visualizing, don't we? Satan forces us, so let's use this tool for the benefit. Let's imagine a balloon filled with helium, okay? We have imagined it, and now imagine that it is you. So in order to come, To the spiritual world, you should just fly up to the clouds. Let's say, since God lives in the clouds, as we were taught, a balloon filled with helium can easily fly up to the clouds. What do we need? To get untied. Right. And here's the trouble, my friends. What is the trouble, in fact? The trouble is that this balloon is anchored to a whole mountain of stones underneath. And our task is just to throw all the stones of ourselves These are all the tricks of Satan, all our mindsets imposed on us, and all the inhumanity that prevents us from really taking a deep breath, from really feeling God's love, getting filled with it and flying up. So, every day, every moment, you should accumulate love to such an extent and, let's say, Be so determined in setting a goal for yourself to get rid of those stones, so as not to lose a moment to throw off another unnecessary stone. 
If Satan hooks you, drop it. If he wants you to get mad at your friend, as simple as that, after all, how is a quarrel caused between friends? Indeed. That's very simple, in fact. A thought is foisted on you that he is not good. A person hasn't done anything. He hasn't even given a reason. You have simply believed it. But the thought has come. Yet you have started thinking, you have given the energy of life to that thought. You have accepted this thought, but you even have nothing to pick on. However, you immediately see your friend frowning. Why? Because the same thing has come to his mind. Or he doesn't even know why, but he's already frowning. Satan hasn't foisted a thought about you on him yet, because you've been poorly working so far. But your friend is already on the alert. You see him puffing up his cheeks. Hence, this is addressed to you. Thus, the devil throws wood into the fire. Right. He has done something on purpose. Of course. He has stumbled out of principle. Yes, and your friend already looks at you as Q. You see that. And look at him as Q too. At this moment, Satan instills in him, look, he's looking as Q. And that's it, you used to be friends and you've become enemies. Isn't that true? Thus, as soon as any silly thought is foisted on you, take that stone and throw it away. Eventually, if you want to, you can scatter even a mountain very quickly and just fly up. Isn't that true? Yes. Igor Mikhailovich, here is another point which people are interested in. What is the right way to support a person when he has faced the system's attacks? They say, perhaps we can somehow activate his front essence magically or direct more love in order to pull him out at once. Yes, exactly, exactly. Just look, friends, this is the most right decision. To go ahead and direct your love, which you generate inside, not to the spiritual world, but to a person, because he's a friend, he should be supported. Yet whom will you direct it to? A simple question. If your friend has wobbled, Satan rules him. So will you bribe Satan with your life, so that he lets your friend go? Isn't that so? Well, Satan will take everything, both yours and that of your friend. If you just open the gate of your heart for him, he will settle there forever, friends. Isn't that so? But what is the right way to support a person? What is the right way? Firstly, to stop fantasizing and dreaming of magic. These are Satan's tricks and all those urges to direct love to him, to perform magic actions or to activate his front essence. All this is magic, that which Satan pushes you to. To interfere in a person's choice. God has given you the strongest, the most powerful tool that exists in this universe. It's a word, friends. This world was created by the Word. Isn't this what is written in religions across the world? In the beginning was the Word. Right. Let's look at the root of this statement. As a matter of fact, a war begins with a Word, but it ends with a Word as well. Through a Word, love is generated, but hatred is begotten through a Word too. Isn't that true? A Word is the most powerful tool Use it skillfully. If you need to support your friend, support him with a word. Really tell him about his problem or listen to his problems. Give him the right advice. Let's say, become a support for him. But as for your true living love, give it only to God. That's when it will be right. If you want to help a friend, teach him to love God, so that life comes to your friend too, that will be a support. And then already the two of you will go in the proper direction, right? What can be more wonderful than such a company? Isn't that true? And what is needed for that? Nothing, in fact. Simply to love each other, right? Right. So, my friends, thank you for being with us today. Let's just love each other. Thank you. Thank you very much, Igor Mikhailovich. Thank you, friends. Thank you for being here.